Well, hi, everybody. I sure hope this message today is one that will leave you feeling more excited about something that I think we should be very excited about. Are you excited about your high, high calling to be part of the first resurrection? That's what I'm talking about today. Or has the first resurrection become old hat to you? Something, eh, been there, done that. I've heard that before. And so what will the first resurrection be like? Will you be there? What kind of body will we have? What events lead up to it and after it? This is going to have to be a two-part sermon because I want to really get, especially in part two, into a lot of detail about what happens after we meet Christ in the clouds. What happens after that? And this first part, I'm going to talk a lot about what kind of bodies we'll have and uh, how we'll get to be with Christ and what happens and where that'll be. Uh, what time of the year that will be. Will that be in the Pentecost season? Will it be in the fall? And um, from what we can see anyway, does that even matter? Why does it even matter? Why is it important? My prayer is that this sermon will awaken a lot of us. I think a lot of us have become very blasé, very Laodicean, frankly, very lukewarm. In fact, we're quite content to be lukewarm. That is the Laodicean description. But you say you're rich, increased with goods, and you're fine. So I'll give a different sermon on Laodiceanism, but this time I want to talk about just getting excited about this high calling, the soon coming first resurrection. Good grief, people. We look, at out, we look out in the world and see what's happening, and we should just be on pins and needles that, boy, this is getting closer and closer. I don't know when Christ will come back, but surely we must realize we, we're getting awfully, awfully close. So we're supposed to be in the first resurrection. If you're not excited about it, we're losing that first love. We've lost that zeal. We've lost that loving feeling. We have such a high calling. We have to be full of the fire of enthusiasm inside of us to be part of that first resurrection, the kingdom of God. I believe you and I were born for this. Get that message. We were born for this. This is why you're alive, is because of this. Hebrews 9.28 says, Christ is coming a second time, Hebrews 9.28, to deliver all those who eagerly await his coming. Eagerly, Hebrews 9.28, who eagerly wait for him, he'll appear a second time. So warning though, remember the latency in church I don't know for sure if, that's, if those are seven eras, seven periods. We know that we're supposed to listen to all seven messages to all seven churches, so that's what we're doing. But in the, isn't it interesting that to the Philadelphians, Christ says, the Holy Spirit, it's Christ speaking, to the Philadelphians, I'm coming soon. To the Laodiceans, he says, I'm here. I'm at the door, knocking on your door. Open the door to me, and maybe we can eat together. Maybe he's referring to the marriage supper in that. But he says they're neither cold nor hot. But that awful, tepid, in-between condition that I think so many of us are in right now, that I can be in, that you can be in. So I hope this will excite you, and I hope that we get our excitement back to be in that first resurrection. What is the first resurrection? When will it be? With events so explosive, we must be very, very close to it. And with events so explosive, I'm hoping that you will actually use this also as an incentive to look at your own life. Look at the things in your life you're allowing that we shouldn't allow. Look at the things in our lives where we need to be making changes. More prayer, more study, less wasted time, less time on TV. Areas we need to stop going to, people we need to change around in our lives. Habits and mental conditions, impatiences and, and losing our temper, being unkind, not showing love. Whatever areas you look at your life and you realize, boy, this does not measure up to the high calling of Christ, to the full stature of Christ, 
who should be my life now and yours. Use this time, use this sermon to wake you up, to wake me up. All of us. All of us. And if we're laid sins, we're called to repent. If we don't repent, we're going to have to go through the fire that will cleanse us and purify us, it says in Revelation 3. So I hope this will wake us up. So let's start. The only place the term first resurrection is used in all the Bible is Revelation 20. Before the book of Revelation was, was revealed, was shown to John, did you realize that not even the other apostles and prophets and early Christians knew for sure about the resurrections? We knew there would be resurrection to life and death. We knew there would be a resurrection to praise and condemnation. But the idea that there would be a first resurrection separated by a thousand years before the second resurrection happens. Now the term second resurrection is never used. But we, after the thousand years, the rest of the dead rise again, come back to life again. To come back to life again means there has to be a resurrection. The early people in the Bible didn't know. They just didn't know that there'd be a thousand year difference, that there'd be a first and a second resurrection, who knows what else. And we'll talk about that in coming sermons as well. Um, the only place in all the Bible that first resurrection is mentioned is Revelation 20. So you're part of God's very special program and movement, a movement and a program and a kingdom far greater than you and I are, hope to be, far bigger than you and I could have ever imagined. You're part of something really big. You were born for this. We each will have a role to play in the kingdom, and even now. We each must be doing our part, learning that now. Working together more now. Coming together more now. I work with several pastors in Kenya, and Tanzania, and Malawi. And frankly, in the beginning, as I worked with them, they had not met together as one big group. They came out of different groups. And... I likened it to a stagecoach with, let's say, six or eight, let's say six horses. And each of the horses was used to just running on its own. And now God has asked me to bring them together to work together, each one doing his own part. So now we bring these six horses and bring them to lead and to run with a stagecoach and to work together, each one running, each one doing his part. That's kind of the way we are called to do for the kingdom of God. So wake up and pay attention what this resurrection thing is all about. Hebrews 11.35 talks about what the early people who were called ahead of us had to go through and how they, how they stayed firm with God. And let me read it, Hebrews 11.35. Women received their dead raised to life again, like the widow who had the, the son that Elijah raised, raised again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Tortured. No, I'm not going to give in to you. Not accepting deliverance. That they might obtain a better resurrection. Now, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews had some idea that there's a better and all that, but the, the details weren't out yet. So the high calling of being in the first resurrection is something we should be very cognizant about. Let's go to Revelation, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, I'm just, I'll just pick up verse 6, we'll pick up earlier later, but blessed, which means happy and holy, is he who has part in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy. Holy means set apart for God's use. Over such a second death has no power, it goes on to say. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the millennium is the reigning, the rulership of Jesus Christ. And I'll talk about some other time. I think I have a blog on it. Is the millennium the kingdom of God? It's ruled by the kingdom of God. But it is not the kingdom of God. 
I'll guarantee you the kingdom of God will not have a Gog and Magog rebellion after a thousand years, as many as the sands of the sea. And the kingdom of God, everybody will do God's will. Thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth. So anyway, read that blog. Is the millennium the kingdom of God? It is not. It's ruled by the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not flesh and blood. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Anyway, so they're th that's talking about you and me, we hope. Happy, blessed, uh, fortunate, well off to be one of God's very special people being called to be in that very one-of-a-kind resurrection that, that there'll, there'll never be a second, a third, and a fourth first resurrection. There's just one first. Okay. This is not being offered to the talented people who, who win the golden buzzard on America's Got Talent or Britain's Got Talent or whatever. No. This is not being offered to billionaires and most talented people, the richest people, the gifted people. God has called the weak, the nobodies of the world, you and me. Accept it. Be thrilled about that. If you're not feeling thrilled about that, something's terribly wrong. Young's literal translation of Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Happy and holy is he, happy and holy is he who has who is having a part in the first rising again. And like I said before, Revelation 20, the prophets and saints didn't know for sure exactly what the sequence was or that there would be uh, a thousand year difference between the resurrection to life and, and others. And so if you and I end up in this first resurrection, you will be a happy and holy teacher of God's ways, reigning as priests and kings with Christ for a thousand years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a Hebrew word. Me, some of you don't like me. Be using Hebrew words, but you'll say hallelujah. You'll say, you'll say uh, words like that. Hallelujah just means let's all praise Yah, okay? Which is the short form of Yehovah or Yah. John 14, verse 2 and 3. John 14, verses 2 and 3. Look at what Jesus tell, tells us. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go prepare a place for you. Think about that. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And then what? That where I am, there you may be also. So after the first resurrection happens, he says, I've prepared a place for you. Where is that place he's prepared? Where is it? And he says he wants to show it to us. And he says that where I am, there you may be also. We're going to be talking a lot about that. And we'll talk about that in this sermon and the next. Where will the king go after he receives us to him at the, in the clouds? Remember in the Jewish weddings, it wasn't the bride who put on the wedding like we do nowadays. It was the father of the groom who put on the wedding. The father of the groom. And he would say to his son, if you want to get married, you have to get a place ready. You have to go prepare a place for her. And I will tell you when I think it's all ready. And I'll inspect it and I'll look at the timing and everything else. And the bride and her ten attendants or however many she have had would, would then get some idea of when it's probably going to happen. But they didn't know for sure. Nobody knew except the father. Think about that. And the father would go in and look at what the house that uh, the, the, his son, the groom, is preparing. And honey, you need to have some curtains in here. Women like curtains. We need some good curtains in here. And we need this fixed. And this is a loose door here. That needs to be fixed. You don't even have a window at all on this side of the house. Okay, that kind of a thing. And then at some point, the father would say to the son, <clears throat> Good news. You can go get her now. You can get married. And so he would go get her, and she would come with her attendants back with the groom now to the father's house. Now, this is very important to understand. That's what Isaac did. He had Rebecca brought to him. He met her 
in the field out away from his father's house, the tent that Abraham lived in. And then together they went back to where Abraham was and uh, Sarah's tent was still up. And so uh, Isaac took Rebekah into Sarah's tent and consummated the wedding, the marriage in that tent. But it was back where Abraham was. You see what I'm saying? So I go prepare a place for you. He talks about his father having many mansions. Yeshua, Jesus, has prepared an incredible home for you, a house for you in heavenly Jerusalem and more. We'll talk much, much more about that in part two. So in Matthew 24, 36, it says only the father knows the exact day and the hour when it will take place. Not even the groom, not even the son would know because he didn't know when the father would say everything's ready. And so that's why he tells us in Matthew 24, 44, to be ready for the Son of Man is coming, now get this, at an hour you do not expect. So when I see all these prophets and others are saying that it's going to be here and be then, and, and they give specific dates, uh, I know, okay, well, that's one more date that likely is not going to be true because of what Jesus said. Matthew 24, 44, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So dream big. Eye has not seen nor ear heard the wonderful things God has prepared for those who love him. Get fired up about it. This is why you were born. This is why you were born. On, in my sermon on Pentecost 2024, I spoke in good detail about the first resurrection. But in this sermon, I want to give more details and try to build some more excitement about being in that resurrection. Let's go back to Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. Remember, before this, in Revelation 20, Satan has been bound and put into a, an abyss. And then before that, in the end of Revelation 19, Jesus Christ returns with his holy saints and, and angels, and uh, he captures the beast, the false prophet, and throws him into the fi lake of fire of... Uh, Lake of fire and brimstone, it's sulfur. Very, very hot. You know, they're burned there. So Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. And I saw thrones, and they who sat on them. Those are your thrones we're talking about. When you read that, that's, think to yourself, that's my throne. One of those is mine. And judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. I see all these people talking about how it's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. We're going to miss all that. We don't have to worry about that. There are an awful lot of people of God who get beheaded, who get tortured, who get captured, who get killed. That's okay, because we're not about this life. Okay, who'd been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Witness to Jesus. Make sure that you are very, very pleased and happy to talk about Yeshua, Jesus, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with the Messiah, with Christ, what it means, for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were finished. The rest of the dead... Okay, and it says the rest of the dead because the, the saints of God who had died will be resurrected. But the rest of the dead don't live again for another thousand years. Only those who survive through to the millennium will be alive with them. So those who are changed, he says this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. We'll be teachers, priests, we'll be rulers, okay, kings uh, under Christ. That's why, and, and for a thousand years, a thousand years is why it's called the millennium. That's what millennium means, a thousand. Blessed and happy and holy, okay, you can never die again. So remember what it said in there that um, over such, the second, the end of verse six, over such. The second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. Okay? 
So we're immortal. We'll never die again. We'll be rulers and teachers. We can never die again. That's the meaning of immortal, right? Now, how that resurrection takes place is interesting. One well-known uh, preacher, Protestant preacher, that I had listened to briefly, <clears throat> he said the first resurrection is when the righteous die and go to heaven. That is the first resurrection, he said. <laughs> it's not true. That's wrong. Jesus said no man, no man has ascended to heaven. No man. And uh, no one is up there, not even Enoch, not even Elijah. If you wonder about that, uh, do a Google search in my website and look up Elijah and type in the word Enoch. And you'll see, okay? Jesus said, no man has ascended into heaven where God is. And there is a spirit in man, a spirit that we have, that when we die does go back to God who gave it, Ecclesiastes 12:7. But that's not us. That's the spirit in us that has everything about us on it. We'll either be dead in our graves or in the sea or wherever when Christ returns, then we'll be resurrected, and so we'll still be alive. Okay? And then those who remain alive when Christ returns and haven't died, they are changed, and they're changed. Let's read it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17. This will be a very good, I believe, first resurrection sermon for a lot of people who have not, especially for a lot of people who don't understand it or have misconceptions about resurrections and all of that. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17. But even those of you who have heard a lot about, um, you, you think you know this already, I hope there'll be little things here and there that I'll point out that will I hope excite you. That's the goal of this sermon, is to excite you. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17. <clears throat> For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, who've died. Okay? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, probably Michael, and with the trumpet of God, the trumpet that was used in Exodus 19, just before the giving of the Ten Commandments, was shofar. The Hebrew word is shofar, ram's horn. Oh, I meant to have my shofar here. My wife can hear me on here. Maybe she can bring me my shofar. But anyway, ram's horn or some other horn like that. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be brought up or caught up together with them in the clouds. And that word caught up is where the, in the Latin Bible we get the word rapture, or they get the word rapture, rapturi, or whatever it is in Latin. Uh, caught up together with them in the clouds. It's not a rapture that they explain, and they explain it as being pre-tribulation, which is so wrong. To meet the Lord in the air, and thus, shall we, shall, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay. So Christ returns, other verses say like lightning, everybody sees it, nobody misses it, the whole world sees it. And with internet and the way we have uh, satellites all over and everything, even if he's not right there above a particular place, they'll still see it, but he's going to zoom around the world so fast, everybody will say, what on earth, what in heaven is happening? And a shout, I don't know what he'll say, and the, and the trumpet of God. I think we'll hear that. They certainly heard the trumpet and God's voice in Exodus 19 and 20. So why won't we? Of course we will. Absorb all of that that's being said. There's going to be a shout, the voice of an archangel. You're going to get to hear Michael's voice or whoever it is. And a great shofar of God. Elsewhere it's called the last trumpet of seven. There are seven trumpets of God. These could very well be spiritual ram's horns, or they could be long silver trumpets, whatever God chooses to use. Will we hear the shout of the archangel? I think so. Will we hear the first trumpet, then the second trumpet, then the third trumpet? I think so. And hopefully many of us will be in a place of safety during that time, leading up to the seventh trump, 
and we'll get so excited. Picture that. Talk about that. Make sure you talk about it amongst yourselves. That was number three. That one's number four. That's the fifth one. Brethren, get excited about it. The first time Yeshua came, he came to a, as a helpless baby in a manger. And in his last week, he came riding on the lowly foal of a donkey. This time he's coming not as a baby and not humbly on the foal of a donkey. This time he's coming as the Lion of Judah, as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, with power and might and majesty. And you'll either live to see it as it happens, or you'll be resurrected to see it as it happens. You and I, if we stay the course and don't give up, those who endure to the end shall be saved. We'll be watching and hearing and seeing all this, experiencing all this. Don't miss it. Now, how are we caught up into the clouds? Some of you are fear, have fear of heights. <laughs> or even flying in an airplane. I remember sitting one time with a, next to a lady who, uh, my wife was on the other side, but this lady on this side here, on, on this side here was saying, oh, I'm just so scared. Finally just said, can I hang on to you while we take off? I looked at my wife. She says, rolled her eyes. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know if she rolled her eyes, but, but yeah. But she's just scared of it. And then she said, it would have helped if they don't call this place the terminal. <laughs> I thought that was a good point. But anyway, um, don't worry about this because you're going to love this. Matthew 24, it's going to be better than any ride you've ever taken. Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31. Remember how they talk about the pre-trib, the pre-tribulation rapture? Jesus here in Matthew 24 says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. So tribulation is seal number five in Revelation 6. And then right after the tribulation, which is Satan's wrath against God's children, is uh, seal number six, which is heavenly signs. So he's saying immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Whatever all that means, it's going to be a st scary time, so scary that people will hide in the rocks of the cliffs and mountains and beg for the rocks to fall on them. They're so scared. They want to get away from the wrath of the lamb. That always amazed me. I've never seen a lamb be wrathful. I've never seen a lamb that I'd be afraid of. But the Lamb of God, it's going to be different. This time when he comes and he's wrathful, he's angry, and those who will destroy the earth, he will destroy. And then, Matthew 24, 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. You'll see it. There's some who teach, nobody will see it. No! The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I want you to really catch something here. As he comes down this first time in the second coming, the first coming was 2,000 years ago. This is now the second coming and the first phase of this coming is on the clouds. I want you to really notice that. And then he'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. That's when the seven trumpet sounds. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. His angels. His angels gather us up. Here again. You hear the seventh trump, and better than anything you've ever seen in Star Trek or anything else, your body is being changed. It's not the weak, frail, tired, painful body, maybe sick body that we have now. Your body is going to be changed. 
And before you know, okay, what do I do with this body? You suddenly spy or spot this powerful angel zooming down right to you. And a different one to the other people around you. And that angel introduces himself and touches you and says, I am whatever his name will be. And I'm to take you up to meet your savior. Hang on to me, everything will be fine. And he holds you. Bang, zooms you back right up there to Jesus, along with scores of thousands of others. And as you go there, I think we'll kind of recognize and know each other. Is that Abraham? Is that Moses? Is that Sarah? Is that Mary Magdalene? Is that Rahab? That's Peter over there. Wow. We read these verses and we don't get excited anymore. How sad is that? Revelation 1.7 says that every eye shall see him. We just read Matthew 24 where it says everyone on earth will see him coming. Luke 17, 24 says it'll be like lightning flashing across the sky. No one's going to miss it. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, once we're resurrected, we won't be flesh and blood anymore. We'll be something else. We'll be spirit. We're not going to be resurrected, as some teach, in a glorified, immortal, physical body. Get rid of the word physical. No. Flesh, no. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 54. This is verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Cannot. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So the lion and the lamb, the little child leading them, sure, that's a picture of the millennium. But that cannot be the picture of the kingdom of God because those are all flesh and blood. So it cannot be. So let's read the description continuing on here about the first resurrection. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We shall not all sleep. We won't die, all of us, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, an eye blink. At the last trumpet, we know that now to be the seventh trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. No one will be able to hurt us or kill us anymore. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Paul had earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll read it later, maybe in part two, or maybe in part, maybe in this one, that we shall actually be changed to a spirit body, an immortal spirit body. In the same image, glory and likeness as Christ. We'll discuss it in more detail as we continue. So we're in the better resurrection, Hebrews 11.35, which strongly implies, if it's a better one, that there are other ones that come up after that, at least a thousand years later, though. The rest of the dead do not live again till the thousand years are finished, Revelation 20, either verse 5 or 6. So why is this a better resurrection? Now, the rest of the dead don't live again. Now, to live again, you have to have life again. So that's why I term that next one the second resurrection. The Bible does not use that term. But it says they shall live again after the thousand years. That means there's a second resurrection. But why is the first resurrection better? Because those who rise after the thousand years in what we want to call the second resurrection won't be leaders with Christ. We will be. They won't be. We will be immortal beings who are priests and kings reigning with Christ. Those resurrected 
a thousand years later will be resurrected with physical bodies. As I'll show you in the full sermon I'm going to give soon on the second resurrection. And frankly, some in later resurrections will be resurrected to be executed. Those are the people who did not, would not repent, understood, didn't accept it, will not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. If we don't accept his forgiveness of us and his paying our penalty for us, then we have to pay it ourselves. By the way, if you don't forgive others, then you won't be forgiven either. So we have to forgive others who have sinned against us. That doesn't mean I've got to go ordain them, but we do have to forgive them. So yes, the first resurrection is the better resurrection by far. Now, what happens right after we're resurrected? It was commonly taught, it was commonly taught that after we, uh, after we might uh, meet Christ in the air, we sort of just would hover over Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem, for some time, never was told exactly how long, and then finally come down with Christ and land on the Mount of Olives. And all of this was believed to occur on the one day of Feast of Trumpets in the fall. Because after all, trumpets, the seven trumpets, the last trumpet, it just made a lot of sense to a lot of people. In the Hebrew, the Feast of Trumpets is called Yom Teruah. The Jews have called it Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, Hoshana, the head of the year. But uh, that's what Rosh Hashanah means. But the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, means blast, the day of blast. And any thoughts of going to heaven at that point with Christ were shot down. Any thoughts of going up there to meet our Father, God the Father, and get married to Christ in the marriage supper of the Lamb. I heard a, a very well-known evangelist tell me, oh no, no one's going to see the Father. Do you know any father who would have who doesn't want to be there when his children are born, doesn't want to meet with them, or is he going to wait a thousand years somehow? I've already read 1 Thessalonians 4.16, rising to meet Christ in the air, along with the resurrected saints and those who remain alive. And Jesus said we'll have, he'll have something to show us. I've read that in John 14, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> and we'll be with him everywhere he goes. We've already read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 53, how we'll be immortal, how we'll be incorruptible. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, so we won't be flesh and blood. We won't be physical anymore. We won't be flesh and blood. Many Protestant groups preach that we will have physical glorified immortal bodies. No, no, no. You'll see what I mean now as we go through this. 1 John 3, verse 2. The context is not Jesus Christ. The context is God the Father, if you look at it carefully. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he, just said children of God, when he, God, is revealed, we shall be like him. Now, we're going to, he's going to be revealed when we meet him in heaven. But we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall see him as he is. And how is he? In John 4, 24, God is spirit. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Lord is the Spirit. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, God, who alone is immortal and invisible. So we're going to be immortal, invisible, spirit being. And I'll show some more in 1 Corinthians 15, just another minute. So if you're like God and like the angels, it says his angels, Hebrews 1.7, he makes them, he, who makes his angels spirit. Hebrews 1, 7, and again in verse 14, Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. So angels are spirit, God is spirit, and we shall be like him. Other verses say we shall have 
we shall be glorified just like the body of Christ. Now, to make it ultra clear what we shall be like, let's look at what, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, going back to verse 42. You can start earlier if you want. We'll start 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 to 49. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. Are you tired of being tired? Are you tired of having no energy? Are you tired of your sense of fatigue? A lot of that's caused by the medication, by the way, that you may be taking. Some of it may be long COVID. Who knows what it is? But I'm finding out that a lot of the medications people take have, have, have as a side effect for a good percentage of them, fatigue, fatigue, no energy. Verse 44, 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spirit body, a spiritual body. And so it's written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam, that's Christ, became a life-giving spirit. After he was resurrected, he became a life-giving spirit. And however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, afterwards the spiritual. So the first man, that's Adam, was of the earth, earthy, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. As we born the image, in other words, just like we've, just like we look like in our same kind of being as Adam was, that's what he's saying, as we born the image of the man of dust, here it is, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, which verse 45 says is a spirit. Okay, verse 45, the end of it again. The last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit. And then the end of verse 49 says, we shall bear that image of the heavenly man, Christ. So wake up, brothers, sisters, wake up. Get excited about this. If you're not, I feel so sorry for you. Start imagining Start imagining what that will all be like. And I think we're going to hear the seven trumpets. We'll be counting them out. There's one, there's two, there's three, and so on. Finally, after the sixth one, we come to the seventh. Revelation 11, verses 15 and 16. And then the seventh angel, the last trumpet, the seventh angel sounded. Revelation 11, 15 and 16. There were loud voices in heaven. Apparently, John could hear him, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones, they didn't get up and do a wild dance. The 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God. Worship means bent over, bowed down. That's what it means. Worship is not some loud PA system with a lot of flashing lights going around and a big choir that's practiced for hours. And The first time the word worship is in fact used in all the Bible far as I know, is when uh, Abraham said to the men as he took Isaac up to Mount Moriah, the lad and I, my son and I, are going to go up this mountain to worship. And then we will return again. That's in Genesis 22. That's the first time worship. And it just means bowing yourself down like the 24 elders here. Now, on your own, read the next four or five verses and see how it's a time when God rewards his servants, the prophets, and the saints. This is it. That's the last trump. That's the seventh trumpet. Imagine your body being transformed. Imagine how you're going to feel with energy and power and might and glory. Imagine the healing you'll have. 
I think of my brother, Lauren, who is in so much pain and suffering, and uh, he, he's had strokes, bedridden. I think of my, my spiritual brother, Paul, uh, who's had MS so badly, can't move anything, can hardly talk most of the time even, and can't move anything below his neck. Wow, just wait till you see them healed. I can imagine Paul just jumping all the way through the whole universe, flying through, and the angels are going to say, wait, 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 we got to teach you how to use this new body. But he'll be excited. There's a verse in Malachi, I think it's three or four, I think it's Malachi three, where it says that when Christ comes, when, the, when he comes, uh, we shall be like calves released from a stall they've been stuck in forever. If you've ever seen animals who've been caged or confined, and see the joy that they have when they're released. It's amazing. Wow. Anyway, our bodies will be changed. Get excited. Get excited about it. Dreams can come true. And God's dreams for you are real. Far better than you and I can even imagine. Dreams come true. This is your story. This is what you were born for. And then after being changed, watching your angel zoom down, like I said, what a glorious thought. It's going to be a glorious time. Imagine having to learn now what it's like to be a spirit being. I even have a sermon on life as a spirit being. You might want to Google it. Spirit being. Just type in the two words spirit being. I, I think it will show up. Life as a spirit being. And I go through the verses in the Bible that talk about, that describe what God does and how he lives and what the angels do. To fly at the speed of thought. Or you can go a little slower and go 20,000 times faster than the speed of light, if you like. <laughs> Without destroying the universe, to go through, be able to go through walls as if they don't exist. And to see things miles away. Be so full of God's love for everything and everybody. Be able to do great miracles and wonders. To have such great energy and power. Able to heal anybody when you need to. Able to bless people. Multiply food. Bring water. Yeah, dream a little, folks. Dream a little. These are dreams that can come true will come true for you. Now, when is this resurrection, this first resurrection? At the la When's the last trumpet blown? Many have taught, and I did too, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever, that Christ will return on the Feast of Trumpets. And I still think he's going to land on the Mount of Olives in the Feast of Trumpets. But he's going to come first on Pentecost. I really believe that. Probably because we, we thought it was Feast of Trumpets because the, the word trumpets was in there and the name of the Holy Day is Feast of Trumpets. It's really Yom Teruah, Day of Blasts. Probably, the blasts probably included trumpets. But since the resurrection happens at the last trump, it just made sense to call it the day of the first resurrection. But as I pointed out in the Pentecost 2024 sermon, if you haven't heard that sermon, probably the best Pentecost sermon I've ever given. I really felt God's inspiration and anointing on that sermon. So some of what I said in that sermon I'll repeat here. Those being called now are called first fruits of God. The first ones he's calling to be part of his family. James 1.18 says we are kind of first fruits. Now the spring holy days are all about the first fruits. God working with us, Passover. Passover saved the firstborn, remember? And uh, all who came under the blood were protected. The spring holy days are about the first fruits. The barley, first fruits of barley, pictured Christ. And then the first fruits of the wheat pictured the first fruits of God. Not Jesus anymore. It pictures those being called now. It doesn't make sense to put a spring holy day concept of first fruits into the fall holy days. Yeah, there are first fruits also in the fall, olives and vines and vegetables, but the Bible doesn't uh, capitalize on that word a lot for the fall 
holy days. It just doesn't. The word first fruits, though, is used four or five or six times about Pentecost. So the fall holy days are about God going about reconciling himself with the rest of the world after Christ returns. And after the resurrection of the dead, after a thousand years is over and working with those people. So it doesn't make sense to put a spring holy day concept of first fruits into the fall holy days. Also keep in mind that Numbers 10.10 10 says very clearly, in all your appointed feasts and your days of your gladness, Numbers 10.10, 10, blow the shofars, blow the trumpets. Trumpets were blown on all the holy days. They certainly were blown in Exodus 19 on Mount Sinai. They, loud, they heard a very loud shofar on Pentecost. So trumpets is not isolated to the Feast of Trumpets. So in fact, on Pentecost, in Exodus 19, uh, we'll start in verse 16. We'll go ahead and post those now. Uh, it was even blown long and loud and at the giving of the law. Here, let's read it. Exodus 19, verse 16 and 17. came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. Exodus 19, 16, I'm reading. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud. On Pentecost, not Feast of Trumpets. So all the people who were in the camp trembled. We go down to verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was completely covered in smoke because Yehovah descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Okay, verse 19. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Now that trumpet that was Louder and louder, the, the Greek, um, the Hebrew word there is shofar, ram's horn. And Jehovah came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And Jehovah called Moses to the top of the mountain. There was all a smoke and a blaze, remember. And Moses went up. Now, one more point. People God is calling now to salvation are called first fruits all the way through. James 1.18, but one of many. Uh, Paul referred to many of the those who he was working with as first fruits of Achaia, first fruits of Rome, whatever. They were first, the early converts, the earliest converts. He called them first fruits. This is key. What I'm about to say. Only first fruits, saints of God. Only first fruits will be. In the feast, in the first resurrection, which is all about the first fruit sons of God. The first resurrection, the first resurrection is about those being called now, the first fruits now. Those are the ones our Father is calling now and who have God's Holy Spirit and therefore belong to Christ and God. Only those who are being led by God's Spirit are called sons of God, according to Romans 8, verse 14. The first resurrection is for, therefore. The first resurrection is only for the first fruits of the saints of God. Of all the holy days of God, which one holy day focused on the word first fruits? Which one? It was Pentecost. That's another key point. The only holy day of the seven is mentioned time and again as being associated with first fruits of the harvest in Israel. That kind of language is not used for any other holy day. The other fall holy days had first fruits of the, like I said, of the olives and the vegetables, but the Bible doesn't capitalize on it, it mentions it briefly, but doesn't call it a day of first fruits or anything like that. So if the first resurrection is only for the first fruit saints, doesn't it make sense that the feast day about the first fruits will be the prime candidate for when the first resurrection happens? 
Now, I'm going to quickly go over some of these. I did this on, on Pentecost. We'll post these up as I speak. Go ahead and look at them. Pause, pause the tape. Pause the video if you want to. Take more time. Here are some places. Numbers 28, 26. Showing Pentecost. Feast of Weeks is associated with first fruits of God. Also on the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new grain offering to Jehovah at your Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, okay? It's called the day, the day of the first fruits. Numbers 28, 26. And we continue on here. Exodus 23, 16. And the Feast of the Harvest, another name for Pentecost, the first fruits of your labors, which you've shown in, sown in the field. And then Exodus 20, 34, verse 22. You shall observe the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then on this day of Pentecost, there were two special big loaves that were raised up to God in heaven. And Leviticus 23, 17 says about these two loaves, you shall bring from your dwelling two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to Yehovah. They are the first fruits to Yehovah. Now, what about those two leaven large loaves when God says are the first fruits? Why are they being elevated up to God on Pentecost? Why? Find out a lot more in part two. When Christ, the first fruits of barley, was lifted up, that first fruits elevation had no leaven, but this one does. You all probably know that leaven is usually associated with sin, but also know that leaven, once baked, does not is not able to continue leavening. Is not. Leaven, though, is also identified with the kingdom of God. So whether it's talking about the kind of leaven that pictures the kingdom of God that shall spread someday throughout the, all the, throughout the whole world, that's one thing. But I think it also is picturing perhaps that we're done with the life of sin. We still sin, but we're done with it. And so Christ actually says he sees us as being unleavened. For you are unleavened. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 6 to 8 says that. So the two leaven loaves that rise up to heaven, it says pictures the first fruits of God, of Jehovah. If the first resurrection is composed solely of those who are called first fruits, and it is, and it's about them, then the holy day that makes the most sense for it all to happen, and you'll really see this in part two, much more proof that it can't be in the fall when Christ, when the seven trumpet sounds. Doesn't it make so much more sense that's going to, appear, that's going to happen around uh, Feast of Pentecost? The first fruits, obviously Pentecost. This holy day alone is called the Day of First Fruits, Numbers 28, 26. There's more, but we'll talk about that in part two. The timing problem with having it be in the fall and what happens after we're resurrected. What happens? Where do we go? What happens? What are we doing and where I'm going to tell you we're going? It's going to get very exciting. Don't miss part two. The glorious first resurrection, part two, coming up, okay? First, let's ask God's for a blessing and dismissal. Oh, Heavenly Father, our Father, we just come before you and Yeshua, our Savior, and just want to thank you so much for such a high calling you've given us. Father, forgive us for getting blasé, lukewarm about it, not excited anymore about it. We've heard it too many times or whatever the reasons are. Forgive us. Please infuse in us an excitement for you and for your calling. And, for, and we repent for any lukewarmness we have about it. We repent of that. We open the door. We open the door to you, Yeshua. Come in. Come in to the door. You're the door. You're the house. We're opening your door into our lives, into our hearts, into our minds. Be our life. Thank you for this very, very high calling you've given us. Help us get excited about it. May you be joyful when you think of your people now. Yeshua, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you. 
Father, thank you for everything you've done for us and for calling us and working with us and being so loving. We love you so much. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>